Well, let's get to um, the newest agents we have, which are the IL-23 blockers. Uh, we have three of them approved, uh, Tildrakizumab, uh, Guselkimab, and Rizankizumab, and a fourth one on the way, which is Mirakizumab. Uh, and they share a number of features. They're administered a little bit differently. Uh, which one of you would like to tell us uh, how they're given? I'd be happy to, to go for that. So, um, so guselcomab uh, is given uh, subcutaneously at week uh, zero four and every eight weeks thereafter. Um, we have uh, rizikizumab, which is given uh, at week zero four and twelve, and that's the same as uh, tildrakizumab. Um, uh, just a nuance is that uh, uh, rizikizumab is two injections, um, and uh, uh, tildrakizumab has to be done in the office. But um, in my patient population, I think giving a drug Q8 versus Q12, I don't really differentiate that much between that. I certainly differentiate between Q4 and maybe Q8 and 12. But, um, but I think that they're all convenient is, is the point. Um, and I think that as a class, um, you know, we, as I said, as I said before, uh, you know, we certainly have raised the bar in terms of efficacy, and we definitely have raised the bar in terms of safety, at least as far as we know in terms of uh, long-term safety data that we have. Um, I, think, uh, I think the class as a whole um, works very well. Uh, uh, Guselcomab, for example, was the first drug to use PASI-90 as a primary endpoint. Um, we have good long-term data with uh, the drugs in the class in terms of um, you know, PASI-90, PASI-100 over you know, three years. Um, and safety, good safety data as well. Um, you know, I think the IL-20, you know, I want to get a, I'm going to get a t-shirt that says IL-23 <laughs> and me because um, <laughs> I, think, I think as a class, I think it, it really hits the sweet spot. Um, I think it also, you know, understanding these drugs from an immunopathogenic standpoint is also important. So when you're blocking interleukin-23, um, you're, 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 you're uh, basically inhibiting naive T cells from becoming T helper 17 cells. And T helper 17 cells release interleukin 17A, which ultimately binds to keratinocytes and activates them. So when you're um, sort of blocking more upstream, you're blocking just the, T, the IL-17 coming from the pathogenic T helper 17 cells, but you're not really blocking all the IL-17 in your body. And that could explain some of the uh, safety data that's, that IL-17 ha have, such as um, uh, candidiasis in IL-17 inhibitors uh, versus, uh, you know, not really seeing that in, um, in with the IL-23 inhibitors. With Tildra, one of the things I like, um, probably a, a more powerful version of ustekinumab, also injected every three months after induction. And once again, I, I like the fact that it is injected by a healthcare professional, and I bring those patients into my practice. One of the other things that, that I, I like to think about and to also say is that, you know, Interleukin-23 is a very interesting cytokine because it probably plays a role in malignancy. And it intrigues me as to whether when we treat these patients, because we talk about using TNF inhibitors and decreasing cardiovascular risk, but what about interleukin-23? Controversial as it may be, it's my belief that we may be blunting the risk of our patients who have psoriasis and their potential for developing certain forms of malignancy. Well, it's, Just my it's, it's actually under study in, in oncology for that specific purpose, and there has been some role of IL-23 in promoting metastasis, I believe, so it's actually being studied in that role. And it's interesting, you're, you're looking at it as an evolution of stekinumab, which I think is, is very good. When we look at IL-12, it's the opposite effect, and IL-12 actually has some Correct. regulatory effects, and you'd rather not block that. IL-12 has some effects on preventing infection, tuberculosis, uh, candida, salmonella. So those are all things that we're avoiding with these new class of medications that I think is really important. I, I, so I, I want to just, you know, put this in perspective and keep it on label a little bit. <laughs> you know, the TNF blockers have black box warnings for infection and malignancy. The IL-23 blockers or the IL-17 blockers do not have those black box warnings. So I also think they're safer, and I am very familiar with the tumor data and the animal data that's experimental, but we don't have human data yet. And so no one here is saying that giving an IL-23 blocker to a malignancy, pa a patient with a malignancy is indicated for that malignancy. Certainly not. But, Certainly but I would not. agree that, you know, if I'm going to pick a drug, then I'm going to stay away from TNF blockers. And I would consider, after in-depth discussion with an oncologist <laughs> and warning a, you know, a patient, uh, uh, you know, war warning a patient that, you know, the drugs do suppress a little part of the immune system, and so theoretically there could be a risk here, but 
you know, here's the other data that exists. But again, we don't have enough information to just openly say, well, if a patient has cancer, you can give them an IL-23 blocker.